Thank you all for inviting me. Um, I want to say I can't compete with a puppet theater. <laughs> Uh, and in my role in libraries, um, I have been to many of very fine public theater, and I'm just not there. <laughs> I'm just not up to snuff. So I'd like to tell you a little bit first about how I came to know about Nahum Castle. So I worked at the Townsend Historical Society in Massachusetts. In 1998, my first week on the job, a young woman came into the office to do some research. Her name was Betsy Tennessee, a descendant of Nahum Gardner Hansen. And she told me the family had once lived in Townsend. At the time, our excellent collections committee had not yet been appointed. And I remember staring into the vault with a sinking heart, <laughs> filled at that time with piles of unsorted, unaccessioned papers and boxes of uncategorized photographs. I managed to locate the 1856 map which showed the family on South Street in town and then listened as she told me some of Nathan's story. I was riveted. I was deeply moved. It was not a story that could be forgotten. In 2001, Betsy produced a booklet under the Ages of Freedom Strike called The Story of Nahum, which I brought and read. I began to spread the word of my interest to members of the Townsend Historical Society who brought me pertinent newspaper articles and pieces of information over the course of many years. It became clear to me that Nahum's descendants had been researching and sharing family stories over time, both through Ancestry.com and numerous newspaper interviews. The story I'm about to share is really the Hazard family story. I stand on many shoulders in putting together this presentation, but I have incorporated other additional documentation collected photographs together from various locations into one place, and braided in family stories from various locations. Sources have all been footnoted. I've also tried to provide a very brief, broad-brushed historical context to better understand Mayhem Hazard's experience and the true peril that he faced. I believe Nahum's story should continue to be shared as widely and as frequently as possible. His story is part of a larger history and one which should haunt our nation. This is the story of Nahum Gardner Hazard. Early one September day in 1839, three men walked up to the home of Kara Hazard, living near the border between Lunenburg and Shirley. She was recently widowed and had four young children to support and to raise. Her eldest was eight, soon to turn nine, and his name was Neil. One of the men told her <coughs> that he would provide the child with work in a tavern, upkeep, and an education if she would let Nagel leave with the men. He seemed to offer an apprenticeship. He assured Kara the little boy could come home and visit whenever he wanted to. And she, probably hopeful of a better opportunity for her son, gave her consent. Nahum left her. He was African American. He had been born to parents with full, free status. And he was a very good man. And that was the day that Nahum Gardner Hazard was kidnapped to be transported to Virginia and sold into slavery. Nahum had been caught up in the vast net of a vicious criminal enterprise that stretched over 95 years after the American Revolution through the Civil War, 
the kidnapping of free American blacks for the purpose of selling them to slave traders. An early example is June Hall, born into slavery in 1747, who fought at the Battle of Bunker Hill, as well as at Ticonderoga, Trenton, and Saratoga, among other battles. He was an American patriot, settling in Exeter, New Hampshire, to marry and raise his family. At least two, and possibly three, of his sons were kidnapped at separate times and sold into slavery. Jude Hall never saw any of them again. A man who fought for America's freedom as a black patriot saw his sons stripped of their own free status. During the time Hall's sons were kidnapped, the stage was already being set for a far-reaching underground criminal network. The invention of the cotton gin in 1793 revolutionized the cotton industry by speeding the lengthy, tedious process of separating the cotton wool from its seeds. The production of cotton dramatically increased. Southern planters, slaveholders, expanded their planting, needing more labor. Then beginning in 1803, newly acquired American territories to the south and west allowed for these planters to expand their holdings even more, planting additional cotton fields. They sent many of their slaves to some of these territories. And then soon after, in 1808, Congress voted to abolish the West African slave trade. This cut off the South's easy access to free labor. In short, the South wanted more slaves, and they were willing to pay for them. Thus, a large and lucrative market in human trafficking emerged. <coughs> the number of free black kidnappings, while largely undocumented, seemed to grow with frightening speed. By 1817, a small book was published on the topic written by Jesse Toy. <coughs> he was a physician who, in 1815, traveled from New York via Pennsylvania, Maryland and Virginia, ending the journey in Washington, D.C. His original intent was to lobby Congress to raise money <coughs> so that free public circulating libraries could be opened all over the country. However, what he observed and heard in his travels, and especially at his destination, redirected his passions and his energies. He was horrified to witness the labors of enslaved people along his way and learn about the adoption of free African Americans and their enslavement for profit. But Washington, D.C., where heavy slave trade went on, absolutely outraged him, and he deemed it an emporium of slavery. He saw a line of African Americans, men, women, and children, manacled together, and marched along the street for sale. He listened to stories about the kidnappings and went to speak personally to individuals who had suffered at hands that had stolen their freedom. He kept careful notes, and in 1817, he wrote a book based on his findings, which include five engraved illustrations entitled American Slave Trade, or an account of the manner in which the slave dealers take free people from some of the United States of America and carry them away and sell them as slaves in others of the states and of the horrible cruelties practiced in the carrying on of this most infamous traffic. That's really a pretty classic 19th century title. <laughs> Tory wrote of the nighttime break-ins when kidnappers stole family members, and about a woman he interviewed as she lay in bed with two broken arms and a shattered lower spine. 
She had deliberately jumped from a third story garret window where she had been held mm -hmm. to avoid being taken to Georgia. Her husband and children had already disappeared. Jesse Torrey wrote in the hope of igniting outrage such as he himself felt and inspiring action such as he himself had undertaken. Abolish newspapers also tried to raise the alarm in the farm public. African American communities worked to alert and protect their own population, yet still the inhumane underworld crime continued. Kidnappers, called manhunters by abolitionists, did not discriminate between so called fugitive slaves and free blacks as targets. African Americans living in the free middle states along the Mason-Nixon line were especially at risk. Those states abutted slave states and kidnappers simply crossed state lines with their victims for living sales. <coughs> Those slaves abutted, uh, excuse me, in fact, the whole stretch of geography came to be dubbed, quote, the reverse underground railroad. The paths and byways forming an ugly inverted image of the routes used by those escaping enslavement and fleeing north. This was particularly true where whole gangs were formed to work large geographical swaths of the country. The Cannon-Johnson gang was perhaps the most notorious. Patty Cannon, nay Lucretia Patricia Henley, was the ringleader and seemed to have had the character and moral compass of Jesse James, Jack the River, and Charles Manson. She was said to have killed a child by deliberately burning him or her to death in a murder. She and her husband, Jesse Cannon, settled on the line where Delaware, a free state, and Maryland, a slave state, meet on the peninsula between the Delaware and Chesapeake Bays. They assembled a confederacy of like-minded criminals, violent and ruthless, though unknown in number. Two of these members purchased a small sloop, which was used for many of the abductions. Three African Americans would be lured on board with promises of jobs, or in the case of children, of trees. They would then be set upon, beaten, and chained. The ship might transport them directly to the south, where they were sold as slaves, or taken to the cannon headquarters intended for later sales. Those who protested their free status were continually beaten until subdued, and some were killed in the process. Gang members traveled far afield throughout the mid-Atlantic region, including Philadelphia. Black gang members would be used as decoys, approaching targeted victims with the same lures used on the sloop and with the same results. When Patty's son-in-law purchased a tavern nearby, their headquarters expanded. It had attracted a fair number of slave traders and the added benefit of money travelers whom the gang would rob. Ultimately, the gang's violence nefarious activities, drew public attention and notoriety. But when Cat Patty Cannon was arrested, it was not on kidnapping charges. Despite the discovery of 21 free African Americans held captive in her house <coughs> when she was taken into custody, she was charged with murder. It seems a tenant farmer on Patty's land had unearthed a chest with bones, and further investigation discovered many more bodies. From jail, Patty Cannon called for a priest and confessed to 11 murders, including her three-day-old daughter by strangulation <coughs> and her husband by poison. She admitted to being an accomplice in at least a dozen murders. On May 11, 1829, she died by her own hand having smuggled poison into the jail. 
Her story was published in 1841, titled The Narrative and Confessions of Lucretia P. Cannon, who was tried, convicted, and sentenced to hang at Georgetown, Delaware, with two of her accomplices. Didn't happen. Whether working alone, with others, whoops, excuse me. Whether working alone with others or in organized gangs, kidnappers use similar ploys, including promises of jobs or apprenticeships with physical attacks and capture. Children, given their size and natural naivete, were particularly easy to kidnap and therefore very vulnerable. However, kidnappers were all primarily motivated by greed, and the crime was highly lucrative. The South was insatiably hungry for increased slave labor, and the price paid per person increased through the early decades of the 19th century. Carol Wilson, a scholar of antebellum U.S. history, has estimated that by the 1850s, slave prices soared, with good field hands bringing at least a thousand dollars, and some artisans selling for more than twice that amount. The white population was largely indifferent to the crime, both from apathy and ingrained racism. Those who attempted to help or to testify in court were often intimidated by the kidnappers who threatened retribution. Abolitionist societies were of the most help, often the only help to victims, raising monies to collect proof of free status and to fund the travels of those who tried to rescue the abducted one person at a time. Still, given the massive, if undocumented, scope of the crime, it would seem their efforts were akin to trying to empty the ocean with a sail. And as for the law, it wasn't much help. Both the first fugitive slave law enacted in 1793 and the second in 1850 denied due process to anyone declared a fugitive slave, true or not, of all too frequent groups used by the kidnappers. In fact, any cases of kidnapping that found their way into court were supported only by white testimonies. No black was allowed to testify. Not the victim, <coughs> not an African-American friend or neighbor, not a relative. State laws were variable and unreliable in terms of enforcement. In Massachusetts, however, despite the fact it was the first colony to legalize slavery in 1641, it abolished it in 1783 under its new state constitution. In 1836, the court decreed that any slave brought into the Commonwealth was considered free. <clears throat> then in 1839, the same year that Nahum Hazard was kidnapped, an interesting new ruling is enacted. At the time, a young man named George Bradburn served on the Massachusetts legislature. He also happened to be a fiery abolitionist. This portrait is an inset from a larger painting of an anti-slavery conference held in London in 1840. In March 1839, well informed about the kidnappings that had been epidemic, Bradburn presented a legislative committee with his report. Quote, on the deliverance of citizens liable to be sold as slaves, arguing for a legal mechanism for rescuing victims. As his report reached deaf ears and deaf ears and blind eyes, he took to persuading the full legislature in a fiery speech, and the results were passed. Governor Edward Everett approved it, and its passage would directly affect Mayhem Garden House. Mayhem was born in the town of Shirley <coughs> to Emerson Hazard and Kara Boston Hazard in 1830. He was descended from an extraordinary family. His paternal grandfather had been a black patriot serving in the Continental Army during the American Revolution, when, according to the family, he lost two fingers. 
His service was documented in a pension record from 1831. He had been enslaved, either in Connecticut or Rhode Island, as the family itself seems to disagree. It has been presumed he earned his freedom as a result of his war service, after which he went to Littleton, Mass, and married Betsy Boston in 1786. Again, leaning on family stories. She was a Penobscot Native American from Maine, who with her brother had been kidnapped at a very young age. She and her brother were adopted by Philip Boston and his wife, both African American, and raised as their own in the region. Soon after <coughs> 1790, he moved to Shirley. In fact, Thomas followed two persons of color who first moved there after the revolution, along with four other freed men. Thus began a small community of African Americans, including Peter Boston, a son of Philip. It is believed they moved there because of the need for labor on the large hops growing farms. This, in part, is supported by the fact that they settled on Great Road, where two of the most successful farmers of this crop lived. One of them, James Parker, wrote in his diary about the number of hands he was using in his hops business, writing in 1803. Jam finished drying all of his hops. He paid the Negroes off, and I sent them home. One of Thomas Hazard's sons, Emerson, married Peter Boston's daughter, Kara, and they had four children before Emerson's early death. <coughs> they were Nahum, Oliver, Horace, and Betsy. Based on an 1830 survey map, a local historian in Shirley recreated the dwelling places of early residents. <coughs> well, at the time of that writing, 1914, only seven holes remained, showing where the early African Americans lived. They were along Great Road, indicated by the yellow line on the map of Shirley. In 1800, he is shown as Thomas Hazard Negro, tenant of Cooper Shop, as is John Hennessy, who would be the father of Kara's second husband. The shop, which burned in 1818, was owned by James Parker, one of the two prominent top scholars. Hazard would later be found on Squanico Road, that's in the northeast. You see it, the blue circle? Um, he's listed as old. He owned his own home. A later descendant had his original deed. His son Emerson is not cited in these listings, but at some point, he and his young family moved west of the town line to Flat Hills in Lunenburg. The location is roughly at the green X. You see it? And this is where we find Nathan on September 2nd, 1839, the day that he was kidnapped. He was playing in the road in front of his home when three men driving an open team came up and knocked on Kara Hazard's door. She knew one of them, William Little who lived nearby on Little Turnpike Road in Shirley, as shown in the map with the blue circle. Not much has been written of him. The one Shirley historian made an intriguing if unflattering comment, quote, he was obese, obscene, and deaf. The other two men were strangers to Sarah, and they presented themselves under aliases as a tavern keeper and his clerk. Their real names were Dickinson Shearer and Francis Dickinson. <coughs> Most family accounts assert that the two men asked Kara if Nahum would accompany them on cattle drive for hands and pay. But two more contemporaneous accounts, the Emancipator on October 10, 1839, and the Liberator on October 11, 1839, stated the men had offered an apprenticeship to the child until he was 20 years old, <laughs> promising he would be working at a tavern in Washington, Mass, 60 miles away. Nahum's upkeep and education would be provided, and he could come home to visit whenever he wished. William Little vouched for the men 
adding his personal recommendation to the proposal. Kara, reassured by the endorsement of a known neighbor, gave her consent to the promising offer. The men took Nahum with them, and they drove him. After traveling a long time, well into the dusk, Nahum grew cold. The men put him down on the Buffalo Road where he fell asleep. And, for, and upon waking aboard a train, he inquired of the men where they were going with him. And the only answer he got was laughter for his team. Had his captors given an honest response, the answer would have been Richmond, Virginia, where Wilkinson turned him over to Bacon Tate, a slave trader, who put Nahum in his slave jail to be held for auction and sale. This was the same jail that became the infamous Watkins Jail, often referred to as the Devil's Hot Baker. There he was branded as a slave. He had some hot pitch or wax poured on a shaven place on top of his head. And the steaming, graining iron was applied when the wax was still hot. And in Nahum's own words, I had been put into a pair of pants of coarse cloth, a shirt made of old bagging, a blue swallowtail coat with brass buttons, several sizes too large for me, and on my head wore an old stove hat. He was allowed to play with other boys in the jail, and here the various accounts all fully merged and agreed. While playing marbles one day, he became bored. Having attended public school in Massachusetts, he made a shocking request to his jail. He asked for a book to read. Now in the South, where African Americans had never been allowed to learn to read or write, this innocent request caused great shock and consternation. A black child who could read? The jailer questioned the little boy, can you read? Where are you from? Nahum had unwittingly provided the means for his own salvation. Nahum's answers proved unnerving to his captors, confirming that he was an educated, free child from the war. While the acts of kidnapping free blacks, transporting them across state lines, and selling them to slavery were technically against the laws of the country, they were not often vigorously enforced. But it so happened there was an active vigilance committee, an abolitionist organization in Richmond. Word spread about the literate black child, reaching the attention of William Jonathan Clark, connected with that vigilance committee. On September 21 and 22, Clark wrote to three men in Massachusetts who forwarded the letter to, letters to George Bradford, our legislator and abolitionist. Bradford traveled to Lunenburg to speak with the child's mother and confirm Nahum's identity. He found Kara in a meadow where she was picking cranberries. Bradford wrote in a letter published in the Emancipator on October 10, 1839, that she told him what had transpired on September 2nd and admitted that she had been worried. She had never heard from the two strangers who took her son and had asked friends to help write letters of inquiry about his welfare. Bradbury informed her that Nathan was in Richmond and wrote, quote, Joy enough, I assure you, was diffused through the bosom of his mother when I assured her that her son was safe and would soon be restored to her arms again. Bradbury ordered William Little and Shirley arrested for aiding and abetting kidnappers, then went to the governor. <coughs> he requested that Everett appoint someone to identify Nathan and bring him home. But he had to remind Everett of the April 1839 resolve, which Bradford had spearheaded back in March, 
that the governor did indeed have the authority to do so. This read in part, quote, resolved that His Excellency the Governor, whenever a citizen of this commonwealth is imprisoned in another of the United States on suspicion of being a slave, is hereby authorized to employ a suitable person to proceed to the state where the individual is so imprisoned and bring him to a place of safety. And His Excellency is hereby empowered to draw his warrant on the treasury of this commonwealth to defray the expenses thereof. This is your picture. <laughs> Edward appointed Major William Brown of Lunenburg, whom Bradbury had learned knew him. He actually lived on Platte Hill and knew the hazards as neighbors. A major in the militia, a deacon, and a farmer, he had sometimes hired Nemo to pick up the potatoes that he had held. He was also familiar with the journey to Richmond where he brought his palm leaf mass, braided by African Americans and whites alike to earn money. Ironically, the hats were sold to slave owners for their teal hands to provide a modicum of protection against the punishing southern sun. By the time Brown arrived in Richmond, Mayhem was frightened, traumatized, and deeply distrustful. <coughs> He did not at first recognize Brown, who was dressed for travel, not farming. But Nahum remembered that Deacon Brown had a sore on his leg which had never healed and prevented him from stooping. He would not budge until Brown had shown him the injured leg and thus proven his own identity. Nahum returned to Lunenburg with Major Brown, whose route and expenses were documented in an invoice to the state of Massachusetts for reimbursement. It was discovered by clerks in the office of the Secretary of State in the late 19th century. They typed it up and sent it to the Lunenburg Historical Society. <laughs> I have reproduced it here. As you can see, his round trip journey took 16 days from September 30 to October 15. It was accomplished in stages between major cities along the route. Each fare is listed, as well as meals and lodging, including a re return trip when he brought Nathan back with him. Brown also purchased a vest and a pair of shoes for the child, at least partially replacing the absurd clothing that he had been dressed in. In total, the cost, including Brown's time, came to $116.88. Nagel was, quote, highly pleased to get home, which sounds like a startling understatement. <laughs> and Kara, quote, determined then and there not to hire him out again. While Nagel was imprisoned in Richmond, one of the kidnappers had remained in Massachusetts. And on September 12th, another eight-year-old African-American child this time from Worcester, was kidnapped. His name was Sidney Orison Francis, and his close with the case was closely intertwined with Nathan. Two men approached the child who was playing in front of his home and started talking with him. The child's mother, Diana Francis, opened the door, <coughs> and the men introduced themselves under aliases as a store owner in Palmer and his clerk. They said they were looking for a colored boy to replace the one currently working for them as the child and his family were moving. Mrs. Francis sent Sidney to the railroad depot to ask her husband for his permission. He reluctantly agreed, but wrote down the men's names and address. Sidney went off with the men, another victim, a kidnapping. Sidney's father, however, became uneasy after two days and set off on foot <coughs> to Palmer to check on the well-being of his son. He was informed in Palmer that the child had been taken to a tavern in Washington, and he continued west on his fruitless journey. The two men, their names being Dickinson Shearer and Elias Turner, differed Sidney to Palmer 
where they ate dinner with Shearer's brother Marcus and stayed the night with Turner's parents. <coughs> Pardon me. Turner stayed behind while Shearer continued south with Sydney. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> Traveling by steamboat, by train, and by stagecoach. This image shows their route. It is the same route taken by Nameless of Doctors. In Fredericksburg, they stopped at the Farmer's Hotel, where Sydney wandered into a barber shop and started reading the handbills and postings. <laughs> this was witnessed by a man named Thomas Lipscomb, who was stopped to see a black child reading in Fredericksburg, Virginia. Suspicious, he decided to investigate, finding enough information to have Shearer arrested. By this time, however, Sidney had been sold to another party, Francis Wilkinson, a slave trader who was one of Maine's kidnappers. Wilkinson had taken Sidney to his home in Carterville, Virginia, confining him in his cellar with five other black children. You can see the turn to the northwest on the map for the journey. Lipscomb, accompanied by law officials, took off after Wilkinson. They rousted him from his bed, rescued Sidney, and returned with them both to Fredericksburg. <coughs> Meanwhile, Mayor Benjamin Clark had written to the mayor in Worcester, Mass, informing him of the situation and requesting documentation of Sidney's free status and any white witnesses who would know and vouch for Sidney as required by his own Virginia laws. Wilkinson was in prison. Two brothers in New Sydney, George and Benjamin Rice, were sent to Fredericksburg to vouch for and then returned Sydney to Worcester. The Commonwealth leveled indictments against Dickinson Shearer and his nephew Elias Turner for the kidnapping. Efforts to extradite Wilkinson ultimately failed, and it is believed that he escaped from the highly insecure Fredericksburg jail. Elias Turner was arrested on September 27, 1830. While these events were unfolding, news of the kidnappings began to be reported at least as early as October 2, and coverage continued throughout the month. The close connections between the kidnappers and the abductions in Mayhem and Sydney became public knowledge. On October 10th, both the Emancipator and the Liberator ran articles on the Worcester kidnappings, announcing that Sydney's case, quote, seems to have disclosed the existence of an extensive combination of villains, led by Dickinson Shearer. He is said to have confessed that he has followed the business of kidnapping for six years past, and he is connected with a gang of kidnappers, whose organization extends from New England to Virginia. The trial began on January 23, 1840 in Worcester's Court of Appeals, the building on the far right in the image. All the facts came out. The Francis family, <coughs> including Sidney, provided invaluable testimony. Witnesses who had been present when the child was taken spoke. Thomas Lipscomb gave compelling evidence, having traveled from Fredericksburg, complete with a broken arm and sword. One of the more interesting interested, uh, witnesses was Joshua Powell, an overseer of Sydney's of uh, uh, Shirley's courthouse, who stated that Turner and William Little had earlier asked him about the availability of any black hopper boys that they could take. Little, of course, was Kara's neighbor who had found her Wilkinson and Shearer at her door. <coughs> The jurors took one hour to decide the case. Guilty. While Turner's sentence was both postponed, Shearer faced two days solitary confinement and seven years of hard labor in a Massachusetts prison. William Little, who had been tried in Pittsburgh, was released from charges after claiming his deafness impaired his ability to understand what Wilkinson and Shearer had actually asked him to do in aiding Nagin's kidnapping. Had the Fitchburg court known that William Little's cousin was Hannah Turner, Elias Turner's mother, 
the verdict might have been different. The real revelation of the trial, however, was the confirmation that Nathan and Sydney were both victims of the same group of organized kidnappers. Francis Wilkinson, of course, was a slave trader from Virginia, but the others all shared familial bonds. Shearer's brother and Turner's parents, who all testified in support of the defendants, were silent accessories who never faced prosecution. In fact, Hannah Turner had admitted that another black child had been brought to her home ten days prior to Sydney's arrival, and that child was named on that. In 1841, two years after Mayhem's traumatic kidnapping, his mother, Kara, remarried to Benjamin Hennessy of Townsend. The family re relocated there, settling on South Street, that's the red mark, in the eastern part of town that's still called Townsend Harbor. Kara <coughs> and Benjamin started their own family and eventually gave Mayhem five half siblings. The 1850 census shows Mayhem living with them at age 19, Occupation was for this farmer, having attended school within the year. Later, Benjamin and Kara moved to Warren Road, Blue Dog, not far from the South Street location. Here they lived for the rest of their lives, Benjamin becoming something of a patriarchal figure. This photo is actually one half of the stereopticon image on the back of handwritten picnic at the home of ben, Uncle Benjamin Hennessy. And then added by an early curator, Burned, was located near Number 3 Warren Road, Townsend Harbor. Benjamin, described as having an intelligent pace and dignified bearing, was elected selectman in 1877. Nathan had left the Hennessy household by the 1855 state census which lists him as living with the Dix family, along with six other non-relatives, most young, unmarried, working men. In short, Nathan was 40. His occupation was listed as teamster. He married Harriet Phillips of Concord, Mass. on November 4, 1858. Here I rely on Betsy Tennessee's account that the marriage took place in Harvard, Mass., performed by Reverend Dodge, he was, quote, sympathetic to abolitionist causes and often married people of mixed parentage when other clergy would not. Harriet's grandmother was probably African-American. Her war records list her grandfather as Nathan. Nathan and Harriet settled in Townsend and started their family. But the advent of the Civil War would affect their lives. Recruitment literature targeting African Americans was widely distributed in Massachusetts, encouraging enlistment in so-called colored regiments. Nathan's brothers Oliver and Horace signed up for the famous 54th Mass Regiment, as did Nathan. African Americans who served in black regiments were at particular risk, as the Confederate States of America under Jefferson Davis had decreed that any black man serving in a northern regiment should be immediately executed if captured. However, they might also be sold back into slavery. Namo, who had been permanently scarred and branded as a slave when he was eight years old, was in particular jeopardy. But Namo had never forgotten his experiences in the South. He saw the way the unfortunates of his race were kept clothed and fed and the hardships that they endured. He was determined in later years, if ever he had the opportunity, that he would do something to help them. And so he went south to fight for the freedom of the boys who were in slavery. The degree of courage and sense of purpose driving Nathan to him was just truly awe-inspiring. As shown, in the muster and descriptive role, he enlisted in the 54th Regiment on August 27, 1863 in Concord, Mass. for one year. He was described as a teamster in Townsend who stood at five foot seven with black eyes and hair and a dark complexion. As the 54th was filled, he was assigned to the 55th, another colored regiment. His services began 
at Galoop Island in Boston on August 27, he was sent to fight in South Carolina. His regiment was part of the Florida invasion, where they fought in the Battle of Oldsby. On heading back north, they saw fighting again in South Carolina. They engaged in the Battle of Honey Hill, where Nathan was wounded in the shoulder, an injury that would trouble him for the rest of his life. When he, his year of service ended, he was discharged in Charleston, South Carolina on August 29, <coughs> returning to Townsend and his family. William <coughs> Heratite was taken actually after the war. A recently returned veteran with a wife and three children. Nahum's brothers also survived the war. In all, these three passive brothers and at least <coughs> nine cousins served in African American regiments during the Civil War. Nahum moved his family to Levenster sometime after the war. Certainly he appears in the 1870 census, but listed as Gardner has it. It remains unclear when he began using his middle name, but he often went by guard. According to Betsy Tennessee, in addition to farming, he worked as a teamster in Levenster for Stone Mason named Yule. His team, quote, his team of horses usually consisted of six in two rows of three. They hauled cut granite slabs, often weighing several tons, from the Lemonster Quarry on Granite Street back to the shop. When winter conditions prevented them from working in the quarry, they would work in Pittsburgh cutting and shaping curbstones. He and Harriet continued to have children through 1879, and there were eight who survived. They lived in the northern part of Lemonster at 328 Prospect Street for most of their lives. He seems to have led a fairly quiet life, concentrating on family and work. Nago became an active member of Lemonster's Grand Army of the Republic. <coughs> Charles Stevens Post couldn't be free. His war record is included here in a bound, oversized volume of personal war sketches, and he himself has signed it. It is the first and only time that I ever saw his signature. Nahum's wife passed away in 1879, and he died September 2, 1913. His death certificate stated cause of death is alveolar heart disease with old age as a contributing factor. The day he died was the anniversary date of the year that he was kicked out in 1813. <coughs> September 2nd, 1839. And he was two weeks shy of his 84th birthday. They were both buried in Townsend's Hillside Cemetery alongside their infant daughter, whose stone is engraved with the words, Sleep on Sweet. Many years later, Nathan's brother Oliver, who had also moved to Lancaster during the war, was honored by his sleep. He had signed up for the 54th Regiment and was sent into service following the famous Battle of Fort Wagner, later portrayed by the film Ward. The regiment had suffered so many losses that replacements were needed, and Oliver was sent down to fight in the Battle of Australia. Oliver sustained a serious wound when a bullet, bullet tore through the flesh of his leg. That wound eventually proved disabled. In 2010, a monument was erected to commemorate the Civil War veterans. A bust of Oliver was sculpted to represent those veterans. The sculptor, Bill Cody, created a small bust for the Lemonster Historical Society, where it is proudly displayed and immediately visible when you enter the building. The much larger granite bust is located in Cutter Park. When it was dedicated, more than 140 Hazard family descendants were in attendance, some having traveled from across the country. Nickham's lasting legacy rests not on granite, but in the equally enduring memories of generations of his family. He repeatedly stressed the value of education and reading when sharing the story of the kidnapping with his children and his grandchildren. They passed his stories on to their descendants, who continue to pass it on to the present day. 
In a 1912 newspaper account published a year before his death, based on an interview with Mangum, the reporter states, quote, in his old age, he never tires of telling his story and the revenge that he had in later years. His service in the 55th Regiment was their revenge against the institution of slavery and the agents who had per perpetrated it. It seems clear that Nahum's memories of playing marbles in the slave jail and the result of requesting a book to read were vivid and indelible. One of his grandsons remembered Nahum telling him simply, but so profoundly, so eloquently. A book saved taken of it, I think, in the 90s, which is in Betsy Tennessee's book, The Story of Nahum. Um, he also, you know, I, I did say that in 1855 he was stated as being in school, even though he was 19. He continued to go to school. He went to Littleton, to their school, because apparently the curriculum in Townsend wasn't what he needed. <laughs> Why am I not surprised? <laughs> yes. Yes, sir. Okay. Give it up. Oh, whoever. Good. Go. Guys, I was just. Oh, you were pointing him out. Okay. Yes. I just wanted to uh, emphasize that they have a spirit is still here with the state of his descendants. Oh, sure. Yeah. I'm so glad. Thank you. You're very well. 